morning, church. Welcome to Stone Coast Community Church this morning from Four Echoes in Seekonk, Massachusetts, um, by way of Warren, Rhode Island, if you can follow that. <coughs> Welcome to church this morning. That, that song um, means so much to me right now, and, and um, I'm, I'm just grateful that someone shared that with me, and, and it's just stuck with me. Um, and I, I think now more than ever, this is so important for, this, for, for us to realize it, it comes down to that. It comes down to how we treat each other. To be good to one another. I just want to take a moment to pray, and Mark's going to um, just make sure we can see, make sure we can get that sound looking good, but I just want to welcome you and, and thank you for tuning in. This is, um, this is, this has been a, a long, hard week, and I'm going to be talking about unity this morning, and it's, it's absolutely necessary, and so um, 
I just want you to um, lean in this morning, right? I know that it, it can be emotionally taxing and fatigue can set in. And, um, but, but this is probably just the reason why we need to lean in. We need to go to God in prayer and, and to hear from him and hear his heart and uh, understand his will, you know, and, and his will is, a, is to bring unity into this world. And so if you don't mind, let's go ahead and pray with me and then uh, we'll sing another song and then we'll get into the teaching. Lord, we, we welcome your presence and your spirit. We're humbled by your grace and your goodness. And, and at the same time, we have this tension because there's so much unrest. There's so much um, th- just uh, resentment and animosity and, and inequality and just all these things happening uh, in our nation. And as a result, uh, we're confronted with this. And I think that's a good thing. I, I, I want us to be confronted and I want us to be able to process this prayerfully. I want us to be able to... Uh, Get before the Lord and be praying. Pray for our nation and pray for our brothers and sisters of color and, and, and pray for churches and pray for our government. And, and Lord, we just, we just need to really fall down our knees and, and seek out your face and be humbled by your grace and your leadership. So we ask that you would lead the way, that your Holy Spirit would, would fill us, Lord. Because I feel like it's like if we can't get the essence of the faith, the, the bare essence of treat each other as you want to be treated, right? As a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles, let us move closer to those ideals, to love our neighbor as ourself, to, to, to uh, celebrate one another's differences, to embrace each other's cultures, and to work toward this thing that you pray for is oneness and unity. And so, Lord, we ask that you would go forth and that your spirit would permeate our country and that you would touch people's hearts. Lord, I believe that all systemic change starts by the, the touch and the power of God that, that comes in and touches hearts and, and unshackles minds and allows us to see the way that you see. We allow for your kingdom to come, Lord. We ask for your will to be done. We ask you to bring heaven to earth through your people, through a, a love and grace and mercy and empathy and, and justice and love and compassion and forgiveness. Lord, these are, the, these are the makeup of your kingdom. And it's because Jesus Christ took it upon himself and died on the cross and spilled his blood that we would be forgiven, that we would be given second chance, we'd be given a fresh start. And Lord, we, we need this as a nation. We need to, to start fresh and we need to start with, with love and mercy and kindness. And so Lord, I ask that you would go forth and that you would make a difference. And that this world and this country would be better as a result of it, Lord. That we'd bridge this gap of inequality, Lord. And that we'd bring forth unity in spirit and in truth and in reality of, of our brothers and sisters of color that, that feel this on a, on a regular basis, Lord. Lord, because of the disparity and all the different things that are systemically wrong. So, Lord, I ask that you would lead the way in that. And that you would make a difference in this nation. And we pray this in the powerful and beautiful name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. Amen. 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 All right, we should be good there. When the solid ground is falling down from underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see When I feel like I've been let down by my friends and my family I can hear the rain reminding me In the eye of the storm you remain in control in the middle of a war You guard my soul Cause you alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm mm. 
When my hopes and dreams are far from me And I'm running out of faith I see the future I picture slowly fade away And when my tears of pain and heartache Are pouring down my face I find my peace in Jesus' name In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of a war You guard my soul Cause you alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm When they let me go, just don't know how I'm gonna make ends meet Did my best now, I'm scared to death that we might lose everything And when a sickness takes my child away and there's nothing I can do My only hope is to trust you, I trust you Lord In the eye of the storm, you remain in control In the middle of a war you guard my soul Cause you alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of a war You guard my soul Cause you alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm In the eye of the storm You remain in control In the middle of a war You guard my soul Cause you alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm I mean I could always do one more I know <laughs> Just call Yeah, think of one um, towards the end All right. Thank you guys well, This is, uh, we're on the set live here We haven't done this in a while As far as having Mark and Mac join us And, and to, to do this with us So we really uh, are grateful for them to be here And you know, when Mark was singing that song, I was thinking about, um, can you just get this out of here, The, um, that he guards our soul. You know, I really love that. And so let me get my notes here. And I just want you to be thinking about that. You know, that all this change starts with God, right? And, and he guards our soul in the middle of a war. And that we can find peace and rest and, and we can find truth. But it all starts with God coming into our hearts and softening us. Right? Like all people, all of us, of all colors, of all ethnicities, from all different cultures around the world, we all fall short and we're all works in progress. And so let God break our hearts for what breaks his. And this morning, you know, I, I pray that you lean in. Um, we're going to be wrapping up this series on uh, in between, but it's going to be the essence of, of uh, unity. And man, there's, there's so much to talk about. And so I, I can't wait to jump in. I just uh, always got to do my little things that I got to do first. Ken, why don't you come in and grab a seat? Yeah, come on in. Just get that seat nice and nice, man. And um, so while we're getting set up here, uh, a couple of things. One, I always want to uh, encourage you. Like we have a lot of uh, new folks coming in. And, you know, if we were to do this like at church in person, we would always make it available for people to fill out a connect card. 
And, you know, you never have to, right? There's no pressure to do so. But it's our way of just building that initial bridge into having a relationship and into learning more about one another. And so if you could take advantage of that right now, there's a link on the screen. We'd love to just hear from you uh, who you are. Share as little as or as much information as you like on that card. But it's our way of engaging with you, starting, starting a conversation, starting to get to know each other. And, and building that relationship so that you can learn more about who we are at Stone Coast. You know, I think we're a pretty neat church. It's pretty unique. We're laid back, but we, we want to make a difference in the world. And, um, and so if you, you want to get your hands dirty a little bit and you want to just come as you are and leave transformed and make a difference in this world to bring the good news, I think you'll, you'll find Stone Coast to be a, a really great fit for you. So um, check out that link, fill it out. Um, Carol will be putting that up on the screen periodically. And then um, the other thing is, you know, I just always want to give you an opportunity to, to give towards this ministry. You know, we, uh, we like to, to make a difference through different people groups. Um, we, we give towards, uh, our, our church actually meets when we're meeting in person at the Highlander Charter School. And it's awesome because 70% of the kids that go there are from inner city province. And we have a heart to, to make a difference in, in the young people's lives. And this, uh, this week was pretty awesome. Like, because of COVID-19, uh, I usually lead a class with, I had about 10 students in my class and, and we go from Highlander and then we go to Baldwin Elementary School. And it's really neat because our, the, the high school kids get to be like in a leadership role. Like they're, they're teacher's aides, but they get in there and they might have a difficult life and they might not fit in in the high school level, but all of a sudden they go there and they're a star and the kids can't wait to see them. And so we kind of, we missed out on that. We only got to do it for a couple of weeks before uh, the pandemic hit. And so many of the students needed to get community service hours. And so we were able to have them come over to Four Echoes, our, our vintage shop here in Seekonk, and just work together. And um, it was awesome. We spent two days together. And so those are the types of things that, that we do. And then we, we work with homelessness. We work with kids with disabilities. Um, and we also work with the kids that are in foster care and who age out of foster care. So these are just some of the things that, you know, when you give to Stone Coast, you're, you're making a difference, not only in the church, but also uh, in our ability to care for one another in the church, but also to care for our community. So if you'd like to give and bless our, our ministry, we'd love for you to be able to do that. And again, there's a link there that you can click on. Um, and then one last announcement is uh, we have a Father's Day event coming up. And so we're going to, we're calling it uh, <laughs> Father's Day Grill on the Go. And that's going to be on Saturday, June 20th. It's going to be a, a, a lot of fun. We're going to have a vintage car here. We're going to have a, a motorcycle and we're going to have a, a race car here so that you can take pictures with your dad um, and come out here. And then we're going to have a couple of, we're going to have brisket and ribs and chicken wings on the go, right? So you can be in your car and we can come and serve you. And, uh, and then it's just so just nice little way maybe we could sit, sit in our cars um, and and just be a part of a community in social distancing style, but that's going to be a lot of fun. What's that? You're not even going to let me get through this announcement. Okay, I got someone in the background. Hey, so so let me finish this announcement. So Father's Day is going to be awesome, and so we want to be able to celebrate. And you know, so it's a way of nominating. So we just want, we're going to have up to 100 people because we have to order the food and all that. Um, we're going to smoke the brisket and smoke the ribs. Uh, and then we'll live hot dogs and chicken wings. So uh, we know as guys, we like to eat. So it's like a fun thing. Come on out, get your picture taken. Um, so that's, what time is that at? Three to five on Saturday, June 20th. So we'd love to have you come out. And, and then uh, we, we are excited here at Four Echoes that we are starting the stores, starting back up. We're allowed to open the doors, so that will be this Monday. So come on in and, and say hello. Woo, woo. All right, there's a little shout-out, Kara. You, you have the mic. You could have just, like, bumped me off and started preaching over there. All right, so as always, we like to have fun, and we like to make this interactive. So please um, write in questions, comments, thoughts. Like today, like I said, in some ways it's heavy, and, and in some ways I hope it's very much informative and life-changing. I hope that God does something to our souls, um, breaks the shackles of our mindset, creates this, this deeper biblical Christian worldview within us. And yet again, I'm going to say it, that we're all in the same ocean, but we're in different boats. And maybe it's never been more true than how we're dealing with the, the death of George Floyd and, and the you know, the ramifications of that and, and all the different things that are happening as a result of that, right? And, and, and rightfully so, like, you know what I mean? Like as a nation, may we, may we just be awoken 
you know, that all of us that can lean into this and make a difference, you know, and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take all of us being touched by God to be moved by God so that we in our own individual boat in our each in our unique way can make a difference and can move the knob can can turn the degree and start working toward equality for all people and to be able to love and so we're calling this unity in between and you know unity is at the heart of Jesus's message and let me ask let me say it this way Jesus came to start a movement and a lot of times when we read the scriptures we don't really get the essence of how strong and how forceful and how loving a leader Jesus was because he did it humbly he did it meekly but he did it powerfully and he did it in a way that allowed all people to be confronted with the message that 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 would cause some to, to rise up in anger and revolt and kill him. And others, they laid their life down before him and worshiped him as Messiah. Right? But don't let it be, fall upon you that he came to start a movement, a revolution. And so he is, in a sense, a revolutionary. So when I read to you these scriptures, um, I'm going to be reading out of John 17. If you have your hardcover Bible, great. If not, you can use your, uh, use your phone. There's a great Bible app called YouVersion. I would encourage you to download it, Y-O-U, Version. But we're going to read out of John 17, 1 through 5, and also verses 20 to 26. But as I read this, understand this too. This is Jesus' final prayer. Okay? So think about if you were going to have your last prayer, and you're going to try to get your disciples Get your followers to understand what's at the heart of your message, why you came. This is his prayer, and it's a prayer for oneness. It's a prayer for unity, and it's at the heart of this message of the good news. And so let us go ahead and read his words. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. Father, The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, God, so that they may be brought to complete unity then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. This is so, so powerful. Now think about this. Like we know from Scripture that that Jesus stole off regularly to be with the Father but we seldom see 
what his actual words are. And so here we catch a glimpse of the very words of Jesus talking with Father. Let this not be lost on us and lean into like, these words are so powerful and so applicable to where we are today. So let us pause and gaze upon these words, upon this prayer, upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And let us not move too quickly, but to be reflective. And I would encourage you to reread these this week. Take time to read John 17 and the whole chapter so that this can really permeate our spirits and our souls and our minds. A prayer for unity. This is beautiful and powerful and necessary and complex and complicated and difficult. And I think this is why Jesus prayed this prayer. He recognized humanity. He recognized how we're all prone to treating others not so well. The complexity of, of humanity is such that if you look back in history, that we have not done a very good job of treating others the way we want to be treated, of allowing love through our differences to lead the way. And Jesus knew this, and he was imploring his disciples, his followers, to get this, to keep it alive. Like he's, it was like, I feel like he was like going to the Father, but he said he's, at the same time, his disciples were sitting there listening, and he's like imploring them, do you get this? Like we need this above all else because it's unity in our diversity, that will sustain this movement, that will truly make a difference in the world. And how much more do we need that now, today? So let all of us keep unity alive by fighting for it, by keeping it front and center and seeking out God in His ways. And what does it look like to be unified in your life so that you and I can do our very thing? Because as I spoke to a lot of folks this week, there was, there was a lot of things that I heard. The rhetoric was such that, well, there's not much I can do. You know, like, that I'm not a racist. And so, because I'm not a racist, then, like, and, but this problem is so big, like, I don't know what else I can do. Well, I'm asking for us to prayerfully consider what is it that you can do to, to build bridges, to be more unified, to spend more time with people from different cultures that look differently to you and believe differently than you. You know, one of the things that we have to recognize, and even in the first century when Jesus was there, and then post-resurrection, that this movement that Jesus had started and the disciples were wrestling with, they had inequality and, and uh, prejudice was running rampant. Okay, and this is really, really important to get. And so much so that we have to recognize that Peter, the one in which Jesus said he would build his church on, did not get it for 15 years because he thought he was the chosen one, right? All of Israel thought that they were the blessed nation, the one that God had called so that all other people maybe would bow down to them as if they had it right. But Jesus' movement was one of equality and they did not get it. And so let's, let, me, uh, let me help us to understand this maybe a little bit more, that Jesus was a revolutionary and that he stood up for people's rights. And so here are the different people groups of that day. So you had the Jews, right, the Israelites. And like I just said, they're the chosen people of God. So they felt like God was using them and that in some ways they were actually elite and better than. And then you have the Gentiles who felt that. There was this distinct separation between Jews and Gentiles. And you also had slaves. And the slaves were, were looked at as second-class citizens. And then you had the slaves that were set free, whether they earned it or, or whatnot, but they were called the freedmen. And no one liked the freedmen because the slave owners lost their slaves. And so they were kind of the outcasts of society. And then what a lot of us don't realize is back in those days, both women and children had no voice and did not have status. And Jesus was putting forth a movement. 
in order to bring dignity and respect and unity into all people groups. And, and for, the, for the church to survive in the first 300 years, they had to get this. And this is why Jesus was so, so adamant in his prayer that, guys, if you can get this, this will change. You have to be able to lay down the things that you hold dear, the things that you think are right, and put them aside so that when the early church got together, all of these people groups came together. Think about that. All of these people groups sat together, ate together, and they had to go through these, all these customary things. Remember, the Jews were not allowed to eat certain things, but the Gentiles were. So when they got together, they did a, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about, well, you know what? Everything's permissible, but not everything is beneficial. I always forget that one. Right? Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial to my brother, to my sister, to my child. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down my customs so that I can have unity with my brother and my sister who think differently and look differently. And maybe they come from a different socioeconomic background. But we're going to sit together at the table. We're going to worship together in the temple. And we're going we're to share bread and communion with one another throughout the week. So maybe when you read Jesus and you read Scripture, try reading the Bible through the lens of justice. Because Jesus was on a mission and we often don't see that but if you can see jesus as a revolutionary starting a movement and the movement is still alive today through his church but the church had to wrestle with this okay and and it took peter 15 years to get it because think about this in the book of acts it talks about peter and the gentiles and he started saying, well, no, 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 I can't even associate with them. It's wrong for me to associate with them. It's wrong for me to go into their house. It's wrong for me to eat with them. And one day, God shows up in a dream. And he shakes Peter to the core. And in that, God revealed them to him. He's like, this is why I came, Peter. Don't you get that? This is why I came. To give life and hope to all people. Lay down the things that you think make you better than. And start to go in and be with the other. Spend time with. Get to know. Because it's in that. It's in the sharing of life and going through life together that we can empathize, that we can understand better, that we can listen, that we can participate. And we can make a difference together. But it, it, it also kind of makes me pause a little bit because if you think about it, Peter walked with Jesus. He was part of the movement and he still missed it. So let us not be so quick to judge. As a white man, I cannot claim to know what it's like to be black and vice versa but I surely can do my part and walk down a journey and come alongside my brothers and sisters of color and find out more what it's like. What's it like to live in America? The things that I don't have to concern myself with. I was talking to someone this week and just saying that when my kids, they all drive now, so they're all over 16 I never had to have a conversation with them about what to do if they get pulled over by the cops. Never. Never talked about it. That there's this, these steps that I should follow. And it wasn't until I talked to an African-American woman, a mom, who said, Sean, here's the things that I had to tell my kids. And just because of that interaction, because of my relationship with her, because I was interested and I wanted to know more about her life, and what's it like for her to raise children here in America? That I then was struck with that. I was like, oh my gosh. Like, what other things do I miss? What other things do I take for granted? Hmm. So but the point is maybe to let us, to pause. Not with judgment, but with concern 
with empathy to gain more understanding so that I can be a better kingdom citizen and a better uh, friend to people from all races and all ethnicities and all cultures. So let me, let me dive into these verses a little bit here at a time. So I'm going back to John 17. We'll look at the first three verses, one through three. It says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. And I just love this. Like, so he starts to define what eternal life is. And, and for some of us in church circles, we've been raised a certain way to believe eternal life is a certain, uh, you know, we have, a, we have an image of what it is. And we have our favorite verses that we hold on to, but maybe this is not one of them. But in this one, it says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So N.T. Wright has this, this one. I'll, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that in a second. But N.T. Wright has a quote that pertains right to these verses. And I just want you to um, reflect on this quote for a moment. It says, this eternal life, this life of the coming age is not just something which people can have after their death. It isn't simply that in some future state, the world will go on forever and ever, and we shall be part of it. The point is, rather, that this new sort of life has come to birth in the world in and through Jesus once he has completed the final victory over death itself, all his followers, all who trust him and believe that he has truly come from the Father and has truly unveiled the Father's character and purpose, all of them can and will possess eternal life right here and now. That too has been one of the greatest themes of this gospel. And he references John 3.16 and John 5.24. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about this new sort of life, right? Like, whenever I think about this, it's like, this is kingdom living. I said, I said in an a, in a awakening daily devotional thing during the week, I talked about like um, the difference between being a human being and being a spirit being. And, and I'm such a better person when I'm a spirit being. Instead, get the human side out and let me take on God's ways, right? And, and I put in here is like this idea of reckless love, like that, that come what may, I am going to pursue love for the other. And let me and let you be people filled with God's spirit and such that we are so um, drawn to people drawn to see and love and appreciate the person next to you. May we pause and understand the love of Christ and get to know our neighbor. And this idea of being grace-filled. When you touch the grace of God, and you've been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've now experienced grace. And grace is, is this idea, it's undeserving. It's a gift. And the more I and we get to know God, the more I understand His grace and His goodness toward all people. And because I recognize that my own brokenness, my, all, my own shortcomings, the places where I don't add up and I'm not living it out, I understand God's grace and that then I can give that grace away to others. And then this new sort of life is, is about being others-minded. Right? It's, it's about being more interested, more concerned with, more empathic, more compassionate, more intentional for the other. We just had Matt and Mark join us this morning, and they're coming from Matthewson Street Church. I didn't talk to them. I don't know what they did there, other than I know that they play music there, and I know that they're surrounded by people that are the quote-unquote outcasts of society, the homeless. And just saying that makes me cringe. 
right? Like we label these folks the homeless versus the children of God that are struggling with homelessness. They're children, they're sons and daughters of God. And somehow we've allowed them to fall through the cracks and we just turn our eyes. We put our hands over our ears and we pretend like it doesn't exist. And it does something for my soul when Mark and Matt come here. And they're late. Dang it, right? And they're late because there was an impromptu prayer. The people on the streets wanted to get together and pray. How beautiful is that? Think about that. Like, when you think about our community that we live in, and again, there's no judgment here, but it's, it's, it's this, this call to be others-minded, and it takes something. It's hard, right? It's hard enough to just raise a family and to go to work all day. Like, I get it. But, but God's kingdom calls for us to lay down our life for our brothers. That means we've got to be intentional to see. See, if Jesus were here today, I'm really, I'm really convinced, based on what I see in scriptures, I'm very much convinced that Jesus would be spending time with the quote-unquote outcasts of society, the sinners and tax collectors, the lepers, the blind. And that's why we don't quite understand what it was like to be, when I talk about Jews and Gentiles and freedmen and slaves and women and children in that way, but, but by him associating with them and the things that you see him do in Scripture, it shows us his concern for justice. It shows us his concern that all people matter. And so this, this new sort of life that, that comes out of a resurrected Christ. So if we're his followers, we need to be drawn to the Father's character. And in that, we must be intentional to show reckless love filled with grace and to be others-minded. And then just the other part of that, I just feel like this is important to, to recognize this idea of eternal life starts now. It's here and now. And may we live life with an eternal view, an eternal lens. Like this makes all the difference when you, when you recognize that we're not just here for these 80 years on, on this earth or whatever God grants us, but that we are here not as temporal beings, but as eternal beings. But how we live now matters. And this is the other thing I love about the good news is that we're here with a responsibility to usher in new creation, to, to see how we can put the world to rights. And, it, and it's screaming right now, right? Injustice is screaming right now. And the need for equality and unity, that voice and the, and the reality, the tangible evidence of that is so necessary in our society. And it starts with the church. It starts with having an eternal perspective of why we're here. And that there's a phrase that N.T. Wright uses called rescued rescuers. Like for those of us that have been rescued by the love and the grace of God, that we've touched his throne, we've touched the garment, we've touched the blood of Christ in some way that the forgiveness of, his, of our sins has shaped us, has changed us from the inside, that caused us to be a different kind of person in this world. Like I'm no longer Sean, I'm, I'm a Christ follower who has an identity, right? Who has a name called Sean, but my identity is in Christ. That's who I follow. That's who I live for. That's who I want to, to, to represent into this world, his light and his love. And so as a rescued rescuer, I have a responsibility to go forth into this world and to help rescue it. And in this sense, to bring equality, to bring unity, to stand up for these things that are wrong but to do so in a kingdom way, to do so like just, just filled with compassion and love. And then let me go back to this verse that I just feel, if you get nothing else out of this teaching, hold on to this verse. In verse 3, that we just read, it says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you. I'm going to talk about each of these phrases. The only true God and Jesus Christ. Like, 
these are Jesus' final words of prayer. So let us reflect, right? Like, oh my gosh, do you see what he's doing here? These phrases are loaded and they're explosive. He's talking about eternal life, the one true God, and Jesus as Savior in one sentence. To his audience, this is explosive. This is like, this is crossing all cultural boundaries. And he's challenging his followers to get this. It starts with this idea of getting to know him. Like, do we have a desire to know God more and more each day? And what I mean by that is this idea of how do I get to know him? It's by prayer. It's by living out. It's by understanding the word. And, and when I think about God's word, I'm, I feel like I get to know him when I, when I taste and see, when I try on. And, and when, I'm, when I refuse to try on something in which he puts forth in his word for us to try on, am I not willing to get to know him in that way? And that breaks my heart. Because like, it's like God wants to give us life and I refuse it. I close the door on, no, you cannot have this part of me. I don't want to know you in this way. I'd rather hold on to what I think is right. And, and this is our human nature. This is, this is how we are. But this is the slow process in which God, by his grace, wants to gently come alongside and prune and whittle away and make evident like God loves us so much that he does that. And if he does that for us, can we not do that for our fellow man and woman? Can I got not get to know people the way that God knows them? Can we at Stone Coast be the kind of church that will take the time to know people where they're at? With their struggles their pain with us getting it wrong with us not seeing eye to eye not listening to the same music not eating the same kinds of food not having the same color skin can we get to know each other and ask questions and spend time with And it starts with me. It starts with you. But I need God to forgive me as a Christian man, as a Christian leader, because when I, the door that I don't let him go into is the door of justice. Right? And it's a cop-out because it's something that I hold on to. I'm, fr I'm afraid that people are going to leave me, that they're going to abandon me because something happened in my past. And I need God's healing in that because I've got to be able to risk and I got to be able to say things and do things and lead in certain ways that stands up for equality and stands up for justice. Because our brothers and sisters are worth it. They're worth it. And I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to us as a church, and I want to read it to you. Remind me, I got to get back to these other notes too, okay? <laughs> because um, I want to keep talking about this verse. But I felt moved in the middle of the night to come up with a response for what's happening in our nation. And uh, I sent it out late last night, so I apologize if you haven't gotten it yet, but this is why I do want to read it to us, because I want to make sure that you understand this leader's heart and where I'm at and how I want our church to be. And even in this letter, it's not right. It's not perfect. You're going to find problems with it. Just recognize, like, this is my and our attempt. I, I had our team look at this, and we rewrote it a few times. And I'm just calling it the need for love to lead the way. And I said, dear Stone Coast, ah, Sorry. Uh, 
Hmm. I am deeply saddened and troubled by the death of our brother, George Lo Floyd. A life has been lost senselessly, inhumanely, and unnecessarily. I would ask all of us to pause here and just pray. Romans 12 says, let us mourn with those who mourn. So let us fall down on our knees and pray for our country. Pray for George Floyd's family and friends who have lost a loved one. Pray for our brothers and sisters of color who are in pain and are exasperated with yet another example of racial inequality and division in our country. Pray for our police officers and their families. Pray for our state and our national leaders. Pray for our churches and let us pray for one another. Let us be reminded we are all children of God and that Christ died for all so we would be one in unity. God made people black and brown and white and we were all made in his image and he loves us just the way we are. Let us love one another in this same manner. At Stone Coast, we are committed to bringing awareness, engaging in conversation, and taking action steps toward bringing about much needed change. May we be Christ followers who love all people deeply, who treat all people with dignity and respect, and who demonstrate compassion. Let us begin this change by listening to understand, not to respond. Let us prayerfully engage in dialogue to expand our perspective in order to grow together and uphold justice for humanity, especially for our brothers and sisters who have been oppressed and marginalized. Micah 6, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God? In order to bring about any change, I think it starts with me as an individual and us as a community. It starts with awareness. It starts with a posture of love and listening and really hearing what our brothers and sisters are expressing. May we learn to put ourselves in another person's shoes and be willing to walk an extra mile in them and with them. May we surround ourselves with people from all walks of life so we learn to love people who are different than us. I have heard stories of black people sharing what it's like going through life and the fatigue that is present in dealing with all the fear, the fear of going outside at nighttime, fear of getting falsely accused of stealing, fear of getting pulled over, and yes, fear of dying, the fatigue of navigating systemic evils, socioeconomic disparity, subpar school systems, and the list goes on and on and on. I have heard the despair from our black brothers and sisters they are losing hope that anything will change. And this saddens me. I can do better. The change begins with each one of us. As a church, we need to look more deeply to what it means to love thy neighbor and to treat people the way Jesus would. May he lead us and fill us with his Holy Spirit to bring about unity and healing to our nation and let us be like Christ amidst these injustices. We will be starting a new series next Sunday to start the conversation, to bring awareness to issues that we don't often talk about, and to grow together so we can walk along a path that works toward equality for all people. As we usher in God's kingdom and his new creation, God be with us. Honey. Um, so... That's my heart, and um, it's a lot more raw than that, too, just so you know. <laughs> um, I take this very, very personally, and I feel like I haven't done enough, and I've let down my brothers of color and sisters of color. I feel like that's why I'm so emotional, and um, I just want us to, I want me and us to do better. And so, let me try to pull it together here and see if I need to say anything more about this.
And I think maybe, in a way, this is what Jesus' prayer was when he says to, that they know you, right? Like, like as I'm just pleading with us to get to know him and that I am pleading with myself, like get to know God in this way, this, this way of that justice matters and be willing to put yourself on the line for what matters and stand up for people that other people don't stand up for. Like may God break something in me and break something in you and break something in us that we would know God in this way. Just like I referenced earlier, like Peter didn't know God in this way. It took 15 years for him to get it, but then, but then God showed up and he woke him up and then Peter led the cause. And so let us each do that. And then Jesus throws in this, this provocative ev- and evocative thing about the only true God. Like think about how in, in your face this is, right? Because there are many gods and, and all these different people groups believe differently. And then here's Jesus saying, no, no, no. It's the one true God, the only God. And so he doesn't like shrink back either from why he's here in the cause. He puts it forth for people to have to wrestle with, to be confronted by. And will you lay down these things in order to pursue this higher calling? And this is what it's about for us today. Can we listen to our brothers and sisters in a different way so that we can present the one true God in a way that is palatable, in a way that can be receptive, in a way that is something that will draw them into this kingdom and draw them to be a part of the good news and to come alongside us in the mission that God has given to us to bring good news into the world. And so our ability to have conversations with people matters. And this is why, like, I'm, I'm so, like, we want to start a conversation. This is, this is one issue that has layers and layers and layers of issues. And so we're not going to do it justice, right? But we're going to engage in it and start a conversation. And it's the same thing. I was talking to someone else about, they talk about, like, don't talk about politics and don't talk about church. And, like, this is the very thing that Jesus is putting in his prayer. Is like, wait a second, the only true God wrestle with that because i'm putting it in the equation i'm putting it in the thing for you to consider that part of you being fully human is to wrestle with that and not only am i going to start with that but then i'm also going to say and jesus christ and i'm adding this as lord and savior what does it say whom you have sent right so not only is he talking about god the father now he's saying to all those that didn't even believe in jesus the one that was crucified now you have to deal with him you got to deal with the person of Jesus Christ and his deity and his humanity and what he stood for and what he died for. And so like, this is important that we learn how to build bridges. And, and when I talk to people about Jesus, it's like, I start with this. I'm like, wherever you're at in the spiritual spectrum is great. I don't care if you're an atheist, agnostic of different faiths, whatever you are is perfect. Can we engage in a dialogue? Help me understand what your thoughts are, where, where you come from, how'd you get to this thought life and this belief, etc. And then be able to share. And I stop, the, the bridge building process is this. A Christian worldview, in my opinion, if I break it down into its essence, it's a love for God, and then it's a love for man. Will you love your neighbor as yourself? Will you treat people the way you want to be treated? Will you show dignity and respect to all people? Will you stand up for the poor? Will you give your life away to to, to other people? I haven't met a person yet when I talk like this that go, no, I I want nothing to do with that. Like, I don't believe in any of that. I don't want anything to do with that, right? Like, most people look at that and say, you know what? If, If we could get that, I'm all into that. I'm just not into this, all these other, the the crap of it, right? Like, all these other things that go with the, the, the buildings and the systems and the, so just give me Jesus, right? Just give me Jesus and his ways. And I know that falls short too, because guess what? Not everyone wants Jesus. They killed him. Another thing I just want to say to you briefly, like this week has been one of those weeks. And, um, and we had a situation that, that arose here, both at the store and at the church, where someone was um, harassing our, our Facebook pages. And 
the essence of it was this person was was trying to demean the character of an individual that we know and love. And and in it, it's trying to bring hurt and pain and to remind a person of their past. And I couldn't have been more proud of our team for wrestling with this issue. And I'd never been more clear on who we are as a church that we will stand up for, for people and give people second chances, people who have a past, that we believe in the redemption of humankind through the blood of Jesus Christ at such a deep level that we're willing to do whatever it takes to uphold this person's character and who she is as a redeemed person of God, as a child of God, come what may. And when we are a church that stands up for, for, for people, it takes something. But I'm going to say that it's like the message of Christ is grace and forgiveness and redemption and second chances. And we are going to be a church that does this. And it's not easy because it has fallout. It has consequences. It has residual things. And it's hard and it's painful. But I believe that this is part of why Stone Coast exists. And we will stand up for people and give them second chances. And we will go through the pain that comes with those decisions. And I want you to be the church, to be people who are filled with grace and so readily give that away to the people in your life. The power of the blood of Christ to heal and redeem all people is central to who we are at Stone Coast. And we have an image of a table. And I ask myself this question regularly, and I ask it of you. There's several questions. Who's sitting at your table? And you ponder that, and you ask yourself, hmm, for me, They're all white, middle-class people who believe the same that I believe. It leads me to the next question, is who's not sitting at our table? I think that's one of the reasons why I love having our church at Highlander, why I love doing community service projects. It was so great. I worked on my Spanish this this week. (laughs) And me hablo un poco. (laughs) Yo hablo, huh? I know. I did it purposely, honey. It's part of the joke, right? But it was awesome. I took pictures and we had several ethnicities here, you know, white and brown and black, English speaking, Spanish speaking. And I just love diversity and it breaks my heart that our church isn't more diverse. And I pray that God would open that up to us. And I believe it starts with me. And then I ask this question, who won't you sit with? That's a tough question. There's people that you and I refuse to have at the table. And I, there's no judgment in that when I say that because we're all in this together and we're all part of humanity. But this is the part of having God wrestle I mean, that we wrestle with God and that allow our hearts to be broken. And, and it reveals, in my opinion, it reveals how far I have to go with God's grace. Like, if I can't sit with, and then you put on, whether it's a pedophile or a murderer, an adulterer, I don't, whatever you put on that, and you say, I will not have that person sit at my table. I can't. I just can't do it for whatever reason. And then I just think, like, I'm a work in progress. And I might be wrong in this, but I think I put forth that Jesus would sit with anyone and everyone because he came to redeem mankind so that every person, regardless of what they've done in their past, has the opportunity to touch the hem, to enter the throne, to be touched by the presence of God, the one who can change lives. I was actually thinking about that like, God used Moses, who 
killed somebody. He used David, who had a man killed so that he could sleep with his wife. He used Paul, known as Saul first, who persecuted and had people of the way killed, and then redeemed his life, that he wrote the majority of the New Testament that has influenced the the world ever since for 2,000 years. Like, you can't tell me that God's grace and who he is through Jesus Christ isn't a God who loves seeing people redeemed, and I would say all people. It's It's a tough message, right? It's a tough message, but this is what we're called to. So continuing on, any questions, comments, thoughts out there in Facebook land? I didn't think there would be, but it's okay. I just just trust that God is meeting you where you're at this morning. John 17, picking up with verses 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe, meaning like people who don't know yet, that they'll believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Mark, are you going to have a song at the end, do you think? Oh, perfect. I'm going to close here in a minute. So get ready. I'm going to leave you with this quote and then a thought. Uh, I'll, I'll pick this up on Wednesday night. It seems like that's what's happening. And Mark, uh, Matt, you're not here Wednesday, right? No. Okay. <laughs> I messed that up last week. Sorry. Um, so let me read to you this quote by N.T. Wright. And then I'm going to have Mark play a song. <sighs> says, just as the father is in the Son, and the Son in the Father, so we too are to live within that unity. That can only mean that we ourselves are to be united. And in case we might miss the point, the result of this will be that the world will see and know, right, that this kind of human community, think about this, that this kind of human community united across all traditional barriers of race, custom, gender, or class can only come from the action of the Creator God so that the world may believe. This is what we desperately need now, right? Like this idea of unity, and it starts with God through Christ to His church, but the church, oh man, If we get it right, if the church would go forth into all the world empowered by the Spirit of God, then we would see this unity played out and there would be healing just like it did when Peter finally got it 15 years later. And then all of a sudden, healing came into the early church where they sat together and ate together and communed together and lived together and gave to one another and laid down the things that were different in their cultures and in the color of their skin. And they they were bound together by the love and the mission of Christ. This is reflective of God's church. I'll pray and then you sing. Is that good? Jesus Cause us, cause us to know you. And cause us to wrestle with. And cause us to lean into. And cause us to uphold and stand for unity. Ask ourselves the difficult questions like, what can I do? What does love require of me in this moment, here and now, that I might grow and become more like Christ And that I can do something to bring unity into this world. And I can bridge that gap. And I can do something. So God, Spirit, whisper. Whisper into our souls and into our hearts and into our minds. And let us hear your voice and let us have the courage to go forth. So that the power of your love, which is required of us that we lay down our life for the other, would go forth. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. A little shaky right now. <laughs> I heard a lot of talk about love this morning, and uh, and I had about f five different songs kind of running through my mind and running through my heart, um, and then. Uh, about 10 seconds ago, decided on this one. Sometimes I pray under the moon, and I thank God I'm breathing. And I pray, don't take me soon, cause I'm here for a reason. Sometimes in my tears I drown. But I never let it get me down Cause when negativity surrounds I know someday it'll all turn around Because all my life I've been waiting for I've been praying for For the people to say hey That we don't wanna fight no more There'll be no more wars And our children will play as yes, one day One day One day about the win or lose Cause we all lose when we feed on the souls of the innocent blood-drenched pavement keep on moving though the waters stay raging in this maze you can lose your way your way it might drive you crazy but don't let it get in your way no way sometimes in my tears I drown but I never let it get me down Cause when negativity surrounds I know someday it'll all turn around Because all my life I've been waiting for I've been praying for For the people to say yes That we don't wanna fight no more There'll be no more wars And our children will play yes for one day One day all will change treat people the same stop all the violence down with the hate one day we'll all be free and proud to be under the same song singing songs of freedom like what yo 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 like what yo 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 like what yo 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 like what yo 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 one day this all will change Stop all the violence and down with the hate. One day we'll all be free and proud to be under the same song, singing songs of freedom like what yo yo yo, like what yo 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 yo. One day, one day, one. Day, one day, one day, one day It's one day, why can't that be today? Oh yeah, 